Hello and welcome. I wanted to try recording a tutorial that takes you from an empty Indigo project to a working game. Uh, so today we're going to build Snake. Uh, Snake isn't the most exciting subject matter, but I happen to think it's a pretty good Hello World first game project because you, you have to cover a lot of the basic concepts, both for game development and Indigo uh, as an engine. Um, the logic and the modeling isn't too overwhelming and you get something pretty playable pretty quickly. Um, so let's get started. Uh, to get the most out of this video, uh, why not try following along? This is, uh, I was going to start off, the first thing we're going to do is just walk around the project structure. So this is a mill build. Um, and the way I've done this, ironically, is by using SBT, and I've just used the get rate template. One of the options that you'll see in there is um, uh, use SBT, yes or no. If you say no, you get the mill build. Um, I haven't found a nice way of doing that yet. Sorry, um, I, but never mind. Um, mill, uh, SBT works just the same. I'm using mill because um, it suits my purposes today a little bit better uh, for recording purposes. So um, the only thing that I've done which is different to the standard build is I've um, replaced the assets in here. We're going to use these later on. I've put them in there already just for sheer convenience. Um, and uh, what that does, if I if I show you the build, so this is um, the, the mill build file. Um, this is, like I say, straight out of the Git rate template. Um, Indigo comes as a sort of two-part thing. The first part is the library, which is just straight up Scala.js. And uh, you can uh, plug that into any other framework you like. Um, uh, so, you know, any other Scala.js project you like, there's no, no specific requirements on it. Um, the other part is the plugins. Um, here we're using the mill plugin. Uh, and of course, there's, a, there's an SPT plugin. They both work almost exactly the same. So learning it here versus SPT makes no odds. Um, and what you have to do is for each module, you have to provide um, some uh, options um, and uh, some generators, right? You can say generators none if you don't want to use them, but uh, we're going to use them today. So um, what these do is uh, the options tell you all the basic information about your project. So we've got the title, we've got how big the window is going to be, We've got the background color, um, where your assets live. It's in that asset folder right there. Um, we've got a, by default, you get a dot get keep thing to ignore, but we're not, it, it, I'm going to leave it there, but we don't need it today. It's fine. Um, and then we have these generators. And the generators manufacture config, and they also, gen, they also look through your assets directory, and they generate um, code for that. So the point of the framework really is, um, the, sorry, the plugins is to give you a framework experience. So it does some of the wiring. Uh, nonsense for you and keeps your build in sync with your with your game. Okay, um, in uh, SBT, uh, the classes that are generated end up in a place called uh, source managed. In mill, they are inside here. So out, our, our module is called snake. So you look in the snake section, generated sources destination, and here they are. So here is our configuration, um, which of course you can tweak once you get into the game. And um, this is our generated assets thing. So it's looked at everything inside that folder lose mp3, point mp3, and snake png, and it's manufactured um, various things that you can make use of or not. Um, it doesn't matter that we've over-generated here because um, Scala.js is really good at stripping out stuff which isn't used, so that's that's not a problem. Um, and on top of that, what happens is that we all of that stuff gets wired straight into the game. So here is the code that you get straight out of the template. Um, the base project file is this one which extends Indigo Game. Uh, Indigo Games have scene management built into them, so you get one scene, which currently does very little. I'll show you what it does in a second. Um, and uh, here we've brought in our config and our assets that have been generated for us, right? Uh, they're not in use, but they are they are wired in and ready to go. Um, if we try running this, um, You'll notice, we're going to fix this in a second, that this is going to take a little bit of time to start because it's busy checking whether we've got Electron available and, and it's installing it. I'm going to try and fix that in just a moment. And this is like the default thing that happens when you run the template. OK, let's make that a little bit quicker. So the first thing we're going to do to change this a little bit, this step is totally optional, but I think it makes a, a, a big difference. Um, we are going to, in here, we're going to add Electron as a, a local uh, dependency. So I'm going to do yarn add. Oh, there it is. That's handy. So that's going to take a moment. But from now on, we won't have to do this. 
uh, Electro, uh, sorry, Indigo does this for you in the background. Um, um, whenever you um, try and uh, whenever you try and run Indigo by default. Um, so what we are going to have to say though is tell it which electron to use, and all we have to do is say npx, which means run a local no dependency electron, like so. I have to re-import my changes, but if I carry on with this, it blows up because um, I suspect what's happened is I've got a DS store thing lurking around. Yeah, look at that. I hate those. <laughs> okay, let's deal with that. So um, we're going to keep. I'm going to change that. I'm going to put this on here. And with any luck. Um, that's going to sort the problem out. Yay! And did you see how much quicker it was when it started up uh, the game there? There was no, like, hanging around for... for the, uh, for the, uh, for, for NPM2 to be installed. I don't know why it hasn't picked up the the changes, but never mind, I'm going to carry on anyway. Um, okay, so um, what we need to do, I really wish that had fixed itself, never mind. Um, the only thing that we need to change here for our game is we need to change the uh, size of the window. Right, so the minute this is using the default 550 by 400, that's a legacy hang up from my days as a Flash developer. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making Snake on a grid which is 12 by 12. Right, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna actually literally do the maths right here. I think window size. So it's gonna be a twelve by twelve grid. Uh, the pixel size is gonna be sixteen by sixteen pixels, right? And we're gonna magnify it by three. So we're gonna end up with uh, five seventy six. Um, let me just put that there like so, and let's get out of that. Let me try doing a build import here. Let's see if it um, see if that makes it happy. Um, <clears throat> in any case, I'm going to run this, and we should now have a nice square project. Yes, we do. Fab. Okay. Um, the only other thing I need to do here is I need to. I told you we were going to magnify this uh, by three. Um, Indigo is a pixel art game engine, so um, it's designed for pixels to be bigger than normal, <laughs> so they're kind of visible, and we call that magnification. Um, so what I'm going to do here is say magnification 3, and that should do the magic. Um, so what you should see now is that our little colourful box is massive. Yeah, happens to be in the middle of the screen. That is a coincidence. Okay, great. And that is the start of our game. Um, what we could do is um, I'll do a quick walk around uh, what we've got here. So this is a sort of standard Indigo game. Um, at the minute there are, we have all these lovely type parameters. They currently do nothing. Um, they are for um, your startup data type, your boot data type, your model and your view model. Um, we're clearly not using them anywhere at the moment. Um, we have some basic scene management, so you tell it which scene is first. Um, we've got a list of scenes, non-empty list of scenes. Um, uh, event filters are not something to worry about right now, but basically they are a way of um, making sure that you only see the events that you want to see. Um, boot is to do with what happens when you first start the game. Uh, so this is setting up the initial config. Um, you can accept flags if you want to, um, and it's loading the initial assets. You can also, so this is, this is again, harking back to flash days. It's quite often that you'd want to build something called a preloader, which is like a loading screen. And um, this is kind of where you would say, oh, here is all the initial stuff you need just to get going. And then later on, you would you would do an, another sort of round of loading, which which gives you um, the, the additional assets that you want. Um, initial model and view model, we don't need that at the moment. Setup is what happens after boot. Um, update view model, sorry, model and view model, they're going to be really important. And the present, which is, which is, which is for rendering. This is basically the Elm architecture. And when we go into the scene, this is our little game scene, it's kind of a mirror. It's not quite the same as a few extra bits, but we'll get onto that later. 
Um, and down here we have the bit which is currently rendering. And uh, right now I'm just going to get rid of that and say dot empty. So if I run it one more time, nothing happens. Fantastic. Okay. So um, so we've got set up and we've got a we've emptied out the rendering. But actually, what I want to do is I want to deal with rendering first, right? Because uh, I just want to put something on the screen so we can see that we've got something before we start getting into the the murky details of making the game work. Okay, so um, for that we're going to need a we're going to need something to render, right? And that means having a, a model, even if it's a, a trivial model. Um, I'm going to put this in a new file um, because uh, later on it's going to be a, a little bit chunkier. Um, and uh, I'll just keep it empty for a second while we feed it through. So what we have to do is tell Indigo about this model, right? So if we hover over here, um, you can see we've got, uh, in order, we've got boot data, startup data, model, and view model. So we're going to add model to here. Um, and that will give us all manner of errors, because uh, basically it's saying the trait is not being um, uh, inherited, right? So scenes are very similar. Scenes come with, um, uh, if I can click right here, we've got startup data, game model, and view model. So we have to, everything has to line up. So here's our model. Um, let's make that bit happy. Game scene is wrong. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, initial model. So startup data, we don't have any, but we have to produce a model. No problem. I'm going to um, bother myself to do an, an initial there, I think. Uh, sorry, here. So we're going to say uh, object model uh, well, initial. Not quite sure what I need here yet. But that's OK. Oops. Right, lovely. Um, the view model um, is constructed partially out of the model, but it's still giving us a unit, so we need that there. Uh, setup is fine. Update model obviously has to produce a model. There we go. Um, model here and model there. Okay, that's good. So the only error we've got left is our game scene because game scene currently doesn't isn't reflective of what we need. Now, the idea here really is so here we're saying. This is like the top level game model where I'm going to get my my data from, and and the idea of scenes really is that they are uh, they are sub games, right? So you're only looking at one at a time, and and this is one of the ways that you extend the the Elm architecture is by kind of making these components which are like mini Elm architectures, and it, and it gives you local reasoning. In our case, uh, so normally what we would do here is we we manufacture a little lens which kind of reaches into the model and builds whatever type we decide we want our model to be just for this scene. In this case, I don't care um, because we, you know, the game isn't that complicated. So we're just going to use the model all the way, right? So I'm going to say um, use the model, whole model, um, and uh, this is going to be these two types. Keep latest just is like a built-in lens. It just means yeah, update it. It'll be fine. Um, same sort of business. And with any luck, that will sort us out. Okay. So we have our model um, and we're going to do our rendering down here, right? So um, let's just put something on the screen first, right? Um, because we're going to, this is going to be um, on a grid. So let's just do a square, right? Um, and I'll put it in a layer. I don't really need it, need it yet, but I'm going to do one anyway. And we're going to say shape box. And um, we have to give it some, some, dimensions and stuff. So let's start with a rectangle, which is one of Indigo's types. It works in integers because it's against pixel art game engine. Um, this is, we're going to stick it right in the corner and we're going to make it 16 by 16. Uh, then we need a fill. So in this case, um, the fill is going to be color. Why not? RGBA and we'll use uh, green. Okay. Um, and okay, let's do that first. So I'm going to, let's see that running. Perfect. There it is. Okay. Um, now just for like the reasons of prettiness, let's, let's put in another one. Um, and this one I'm going to put at 16 across and I'm going to make it uh, red, right? Now 
what we're going to see here, if I can ever find the right keys to press, is that the, the two boxes are right beside each other, which is okay, but a little bit um, aesthetically unpleasing. So I'm going to, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these red boxes for the apple. I don't know why it's an apple in snake. I've never understood that. Um, and a, and the green ones are going to be the snake. But just so we can actually see them, I'm going to um, contract by by one pixel in all directions, and that will give us a little border with any look. Yeah, there we go. Good stuff. Right. <clears throat> so now we now we actually need something to render. Okay. So um, we're going to need an apple somewhere. Right, and we're going to and, and we're just going to model this using a point. A uh, point is um, uh, like rectangle. It's um, one of Indigo's basic types, uh, which just means a coordinate basically. And uh, we're going to need the snake itself, which I'm going to say is going to be a list of points. Um, and now I need to sort out the initial one here. So um, the initial one. I think later on we're going to have to figure out a way to make this random. We'll do that later on for now. We'll just say uh, apple is going to be point. Um, oh, I don't know. One by one. Yeah, why not? And uh, snake, we're going to have a list. And I'm just going to put in a single thing for now. I'm going to say, um, you can also, there's a shortcut. If you want to say one, one, you can just say one. That works fine. Um, but I'm going to say uh, five by five. Uh, 12, let's see, it's a 12 by 12 grid, uh, but it's only 10 by 10, so I'm going to actually 6 by 6, because that's kind of in the middle, isn't it? Okay, cool. Um, back to the scene. Um, we need to render those things, so we have a model reference here. So what we can do is say, uh, let's do the apple first, because we, we kind of want, actually, we'll do, we'll do it in layers right now. Why not? Yeah, why not? So we're going to have our apple layer. And we're going to say model dot uh, apple, um, and that's just a point. So we're just going to use our red shape here. Uh, so if we change this to say size, and this can be a point there, it's just, just a different constructor. Um, and the only thing is that we have to convert from model space to screen space. So in the model, um, everything is, every box is just a, you know, it's one unit across, right? But in screen space, everything is multiplied by 16. So we're going to have to say um, times point 16. And that should put our apple in the right place. Then we need to do the same thing for, ooh, I have messed something up. There we go. Groovy. Um, same thing for um, the snake itself. So we're going to say um, model dot snake uh, dot uh, map s. Now for each one of these, we're just going to put in a green box. Um, there's an error here, but I'm going to I'll come back and fix that in just a second. So these are just points as well. So I can do exactly the same thing as I did here. In fact, I'll just take all of that. Uh, but this is just going to be S. And the only thing is, I'm now getting an error here because I've modeled this as a list over here. Um, but Indigo works on a type called batch. Uh, so I think what I'll do is I'll just swap this for a batch and hope that hopefully that'll work out for me later. Um, batch is list like. It's not quite as nice to use as a list. I'm, I'm aiming to get it pretty close. It's not quite as good. The, the pattern matching in, in particular is a bit rough. Um, but you get list like semantics, but it's it uses um, uh, JS array underneath, which means it's much quicker. And it's uh, in particular, it's it's designed so you can construct these things very quickly because you, you mostly end up constructing in, in Indigo. You don't do a lot of uh, rendering tree manipulation. You just build a new tree all the time. So So that's what batch is for. Um, okay, let's see if that works. There we go. Not bad. Not bad. Right, so we've done some rendering. Um, what I want to do now is get a bit of movement going. Because uh, at the moment, if we have a look at this thing, um, it's uh, perfectly nice, but it doesn't really do very much. 
Um, I don't want to worry about which direction it's going in. I'm not going to worry about user input yet. All I want to do is get the snake moving around the screen a bit. Okay. So uh, if we had to take a look at our snake, um, at the minute it just has this one segment, but we're going to say that there's a minimum of three and I'm just going to do that, right? All that really means is that um, on the first, when the game starts, it's going to look like the snake grows by three before it actually starts moving, but that's perfectly okay. I think, in fact, I think that's how most of the snake games, uh, how they look. So um, we need to be able to update the model. Um, and for that, we need an update function. Uh, here we go. Now, at some point, I'm going to need to refer to the time. So I'm going to bring in a what's called the context. Um, I'm going to use the frame context. Um, context includes uh, lots of little helpers, um, but in our case, in particular, I'm interested in, in the time that it brings in. Then uh, this thing is going to be a function. The return type is going to be a function from global events to um, the outcome of the next version of this model. Um, an outcome is a little bit, it's a monad, it's a little bit like try, but, it, but what it really does is it collects, um, as long as well as the value, the main value type, it also collects um, ordered events, things that have happened during the frame. Um, and those things are collected by the runtime and they are passed on to the next frame to be processed next time. So you never, you never process a, an event mid frame. Right. Um, and so here we'll just say, um, well, I'll, do, I'll make it a case because we need that in a minute anyway. Um, case outcome, this is good enough for now. Um, let's quickly wire that in. So uh, here we have the model update um, for the scene. Uh, this is automatically wired in by Indigo Game, the, the Indigo Game entry point type that we saw earlier. Um, and all we want to do here is change this to say model dot update, and we're going to pass in that context, um, and we're going to pass over the event now. What you might notice here is that this thing is a scene context, not a frame context. A scene context contains a frame context. If I can spell it right, that should work fine. Um, e, there we go. Um, uh, a scene context is exactly the same as a frame context, but uh, it also includes um, what time the current, like the running time of this particular scene. So like it, it sort of offsets it from the main running time of the game. Uh, which is handy sometimes if you want to start an animation when a scene enters. Uh, but enough of that, back to here. So <clears throat> how do we update the game? Well, oh, actually, before I go on, um, note on pattern matching. So you can't pattern match exhaustively on global events. Uh, they're just a trait, unfortunately. Uh, it's a thing I'd like to change at some point, but, but here we are for the time being. Um, normally, to get exhaustive matching, what I would do is make an ADT, an enum or something um, of the event specific to my game, and I would extend global event, but then I can do exhaustive matching on that instead. Today, I'm not going to worry about that because it's really not that complicated. Um, it doesn't kind of justify the effort. <clears throat> so um, the first thing we're going to need to do is look for the frame tick event. Uh, the frame tick event happens every frame. And it's the last thing that happens every frame. So you always get a frame tick event, and it always gets, it's always the last event that you'll you'll receive. Um, and we can pinch that again for a moment, but what we need to do is figure out how we make the snake move. So uh, let's try and, I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna do this yet, but let's just keep it simple. So essentially what we have to do is add a new head onto the batch, which is like a list, right? And we also then have to drop the last thing. So clearly we're going to need a copy here because we've got nice immutable data, right? So the snake is going to be, um, well, we're going to do a drop right. That gets rid of the tail. And uh, we need to cons a new thing onto the front. So let's let's say, um, um, well, new head. I'm just kind of making this up as I go along. So apologies if it's a bit, uh, made up. Um, there's always going to be a head. So um, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to write there just yet. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but here we have our current value, right? And for now, um, what we want to do is say h, so h is just a point, and we want to add a relative position. So I'm just going to add uh, a position that basically says we're going downwards, right? So uh, in, in Indigo, coordinates um, start from the top left and they go down to the bottom right 
um, in, in all scenarios. Um, again, it's a flash hang up, but that's, that's the way I think. <laughs> um, so this thing, I am just going to say, um, no idea. I'm just going to say, uh, point zero. And I'm going to leave a comment saying, uh, should never happen. I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, if I was feeling more, um, you know, particular, maybe I was, if I was doing the game properly, maybe I'd think it a bit harder, but I'm just going to carry on for the time being. So add on a new head, um, drop the tail and that is that going to work? Let's find out. Gosh, it really was that simple, but where has the snake gone? Oh my gosh. Right. Um, well, what's happened here is that the snake has vanished off the screen um, and we need it to come back on the top and also it went very, very quickly. We'll, we'll deal with the looping first, I think, and then we'll come back to the speed in a minute. So um, this is really the proposed, um, proposed head. <laughs> um, and what we need to do is somehow say, hang on a minute, is that actually, is that uh, actual, what I'm, saying, I'm gonna call it next, next, proposed and next, how about that, proposed and next, that's better. Okay, so this is gonna be, what I have to do is basically do a modulus, um, but we have to be a little bit careful because modulus in uh, on the JVM um, doesn't work with negative numbers, right? So we can use a thing called floor mod instead, We'll do that. So we're going to make a point and we're going to say x equals to know and y equals to know. Um, uh, if uh, proposed dot x, ooh, do I need to do an if? No, I think I can just say, uh, I think I can just say propose, oh, math, math dot floor mod. Um, x um, size of grid which is um, 12 but maybe that should be part maybe that should be a value on here so that we've, we've got something to refer to um, width and the same thing for the for the y coordinate right Um, all manner of things have gone wrong. So the initial, we're just going to hard code it. It's fine. Size is going to be 12 by 12. Um, that's not that at all. That's going to be next. Yay. Look at that. Amazing. It's quite quick though. It's slightly epileptic, epileptic. Let's, <laughs> let's see if we can fix that too. So what we need to do is make it so that the updates don't happen so often. Um, uh, the way that we could do that, there's kind of there's kind of two approaches here. One is we could literally go back to um, here, uh, snake, sorry, where our config is, and we could say dot width um, frame rate. There is a there is a there is a frame rate thing that I'm going to. Oh come on, let's go and find it. Um, yeah, frame rate limit. There we go. So we can do that. We can set the FPS that way. Um, but the trouble with that is that that sets it for the entire game, which is okay, except that um, it means that events are effectively only captured and processed every delayed frame, right? So what you want to do is capture the input events as often as possible to reduce input lag, but delay um, how often the, the game is updated. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a new field here called um, uh, last update. Last updated, which is going to be in seconds. Um, and that is going to be seconds zero. Um, and we, all we're going to do here is say um, if uh, context dot running uh, minus last updated um, is what is greater than or equal to 100? Maybe we should say uh, two millis. Uh, so 
something like that. Um, then we should do this thing. And when we do that, we also need to uh, update the last data to be uh, context.running. There we go. Not bad at all. The next thing that we need to do is um, figure out how we're going to change direction and kind of accept some, some user input. Okay. So um, the first thing is we need to model some notion of direction. So let's let's get on and do that first. I'm just going to do it down here. Um, I'm going to use an enum uh, called direction, cunningly enough. And yes, we will just have uh, up, down. Uh, well, I'm going to I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to say it. Case down, case left, case right. Okay. And um, the other thing that we know is that we're going to need to be able to kind of turn this into a relative um, offset, but we'll come, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, uh, for now, we're going to need a direction here. So our model is getting a little bit bigger, but that's all right. And um, when we in our update function, we need to capture um, these inputs. Oh, sorry, let me just add that too before I forget. Direction equals, um, and let's say up. Let's say that it's going to go up. At the minute it's going down, by default, we're going to make it go up. Um, okay, so let's capture some input. So to do that, we're just going to use the arrow keys. And uh, all we're going to do is say keyboard event dot. Uh, Key up um, key dot up arrow lovely. Um, so all we have to do here is uh, modify our model. Uh, this dot copy direction equals direction um, ooh, equals direction up. Right, I'm going to uh, trim that down a little bit just for um, space conservation. And we'll apply that to the other input types that we can have. Uh, down, left, and right. Uh, up, um, left and down. Okay. Um, now <clears throat> there is something about, um, you shouldn't be able to do this if you press in exactly the opposite direction, right? So, um, maybe we can say something like, so if it's so, uh, if, um, direction, um, does not, can I do, does not equal direction dot down. Let's see if that's going to work. Up. Right. Left. Okay. Um, now that we have that, um, what we can do here is say, oh, okay, when we're adding this thing here, what we really mean is, depending on the direction, we want to go, um, we want to, we want to add a, a different relative position. Okay. So there's a couple of ways we can do that. Um, we could model it with, um, a, a value, um, that we, that we stick in here. Um, but I think I'm going to do, uh, this instead, I'm going to say, um, uh, relative position, which is going to be a point. This match exhaustive. So um, up is going to be a point uh, zero negative one. Let's just uh, pinch that and apply. Down is that way. Left is like that, and right is the other way. That looks pretty plausible to me. Um, so then here we should just be able to say. Um, direction 
dots relative position. Um, it probably would be more efficient if I actually stuck it in as a parameter, but um, I'm quite happy with that as it is. Let's, let's see if that works. I'm going to click on it just in case. So, yep, there we go. Up, down, left, and right. And if I try and press in the opposite direction, nothing happens. Perfect. Right, next time we need to, next thing we need to do is pick up that apple, I think. That means um, moving the apple to a new location when we've picked it up and also making the snake longer whenever we do that. Um, let's see if we can work out how to do it. So um, we know what the next position is going to be. Um, and we also know if that, that if that is exactly where the apple is. So um, it seems to me we can do an if statement. Uh, so if next uh, is equal to apple, because apple is just a point and so is this, then um, let's just make the snake grow first. Uh, so else I'm just doing this like in a stupid way, but that's probably okay. Okay, so we don't want to do that. Um, yeah, so now, so we're not we're not moving the apple yet, but every time we run this thing, in theory, our snake will get a little bit longer every time we pass over it. Right, so, yeah, we've got four, five, six. Yep, yeah, that's working fine. Good stuff. Um, Okay, so the next thing we want to do is move the apple. So um, uh, in this case, so we've, we've picked up the apple, we want to shift that, and we can do that by saying um, point. Um, so I'm going to say, so this is, this is the, I'll do, I'll put in the parameters just for fun. Context dot dice um, dot rule from zero. Uh, I think it's unhappy with me at the moment because I haven't got um, both of these things yet. So I'll just do that real quick. And hopefully that's now complaining that I haven't put any numbers in. Uh, so this is the number of sides. So dice, um, many moons ago I was trying to think of the concept for doing random numbers that you could predict. Um, dice is a value, is a, is a random number generator which is seeded on the current time that the frame entered. Um, how useful that is, I'm not really sure. But here we are. Um, and you, you roll a number of sides. Again, trying to stick with the idea, dice typically roll from one because you, you don't get zero-sided dice, um, but we do have a roll from zero to two. So we're gonna say, um, well, we've got the size, right? We can do size, width, and height. Uh, and I think that will do it. So um, let's get out of there. Let's give that a try. Yeah, not bad. And that is kind of our entire game, right? Um, what we need to do now though, is maybe think about some graphics. Ah, I tell a lie. There is another part of the game that I've missed here, isn't there? Which is the bit where you actually can crash into your own body and the game uh, ends. Um, in our version, we're not going to end the game. What we're going to do is we're just going to reset it. Okay, so that really just means putting the snake in the direction back to the initial settings. Uh, so if, um, again, just do another if statement, why not? It'll be fine. Um, all we need to do is say if uh, snake dot uh, drop right one, because that's going to be gone in a second. So we don't have to worry about hitting our own, the end of our own tail. Um, dot exists underscore equals uh, next. That's our proposed next position. Then, uh oh, it's the end of the game. And just pinch that for a second because that's more or less what we want. Um, we want to say um, model dot initial dot snake. So I'm going to put that back to the the opening thing uh, direction equals model dot initial dot direction. Uh, but we'll leave the apple where it is. A little bit of little sense of continuity there. Um, let's see if that works. Uh, this is where my lack of snake skill will show. I'm going to make myself a little bit longer. And then I'm going to just kind of diddle it. Yay, look. I kind of... Hold on, hold on. Ooh. 
There we go. It starts again whenever I mess up. Great. Before we go on to graphics, um, uh, I want to. I actually want to quickly do audio. Uh, so, uh, what we have for audio is in our assets folder, we've got a couple of uh, audio files, a couple of MP3s, and um, those are automatically included in our assets, um, which were brought in by by Indigo, uh, by the by the plugin. So, if we here we have the situation where um, uh, where we die, right? So let's uh, add a global event. And I'll show you how this works in just a second. So, is it going to find it? It is not. That's really unhelpful. Okay, no problem. We'll go and we'll go and grab this thing here. Bring in the import. Um, so assets dot assets um, lose play. Um, and what that points to. Is this play sound thing here? This is a this is a global event, and all we're doing is basically saying when you lose, um, play the global event, okay? And and it's it's in our generated class that we saw earlier. Um, we do also generate other things like scene audio because the plugin can't tell if this is background music or a sound effect. But um, yeah, here we go. So um, let me close all that up again because we don't care about that. Um, so that's our lose event. Um, and also we want another one if we collect an apple. Um, so there should be uh, points, I think it's called. Point. All right, let's see if that works. There we go, that was easy. And we're dead, so we play the funny noise as well. And that is how easy it is to add sound uh, to an Indigo game. The last thing we're going to do today is we're going to try and uh, swap out some of the graphics. Uh, we're not going to go crazy. We're just going to we're just going to use some image-based artwork just so you can see how that works. Um, we're done in the model, so we're going to go across to the um, back to the present function where we were earlier. Um, these are the graphics. Um, I knocked them up in about 10 minutes earlier, as you can probably tell. <laughs> um, it, this image is um, uh, basically it's 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 five 16 by 16 images. So we're going to need some way of um, 16 by 16 tiles. We need some way of cropping them out. Um, originally, I was going to put on a head and a tail, but um, that's now I'm going to leave that as an exercise for the reader um, uh, because it basically it complicates the tutorial without really adding anything to it. So we're going to use the snake body, and we're going to use the background tiles, and we're going to use um, the apples. Right, let's go and do that. So the first thing we do is we're going to set up some constants. Um, there's different ways to do this. Um, normally, I would have a separate object somewhere with all of this stuff stored in it, but today I'm just going to put it here. So let's start with the apple. And uh, the apple is going to be a graphic. Um, graphics are basically all entities in Indigo are, are a space on the screen and some way to draw into them. That, that's what they mean. And graphics party piece is that it knows how to crop images. So we're going to take assets, uh, which is our generated assets, and we're going to take this snake material. Um, so again, when it generates stuff, um, what it does, it generates the the asset name as usual, which links to the stuff that you can load. Um, but it also manufactures a, a bitmap material for you. You don't have to use this, but it's just convenient. Um, and a bitmap material is simply a material which is rendering the pixels as they are. There's no options for um, you know, changing the alpha or anything. If you want to do that, you have to convert it to, a, to an image effects one. Um, OK, and then we're going to do a crop on this thing. And um, the apple was the last one along, so the start position, the, the offset position is going to be 64. So it's um, x, y offset, and then the width and height that you actually want the thing to be. Okay. While we're here, let's just make the other ones. So we want the uh, the snake itself, and we want the background. Um, and the let's see, the background offset is going to be 48, and the snake body is going to be 16. Lovely. Right, let's let's try and make use of some of that. Uh, sorry, a bit of formatting there. Um, 
So, uh, all we have to do is take our graphic and say move to. We already happen to have the position, that, the place that we want to move it to. So that's great. So we can get rid of all of that. And with a bit of luck, we should now have a pixel art apple. There we go. Okay, great. Same thing, same job for the, uh, the body of the snake. That's easy peasy. Uh, snake, snake, oops, a daisy snake. Uh, we're gonna put this thing here. Get rid of all that. There we are. Kind of ugly, but it works. I am terrible at this game. Okay, stop playing it, Dave. Right, um, and then uh, the last thing we want to do is put in a background. So I'm going to put in a new layer, uh, like so. Layers are not essential um, in general. You can just pile up a great big list of stuff to render in one layer, that's fine. Um, but they do let you do um, things like um, add cameras. Um, you can change how they blend when they merge together. Um, you can also give them um, keys so that when you have when you build separate uh, scene update fragments, they they merge together. The, the, the right layers will merge together in the right places uh, and stuff like that. So they're very handy things. Okay, um, so the background. I'm going to uh, just build a sort of constant thing here. So I'm going to call this tiles. Um, uh, zero to twelve is the size of our grid. Uh, say dot two batch. Ooh, we need some syntax. Syntax. So here we can say dot two batch. <clears throat> um, and this is going to be our rows. So it's going to say a uh, flat map. Uh, so that's going to be the Y. Then we're going to do the same thing again. Uh, Zero to twelve. Dot two batch dot map x and uh, we're going to take our background and we're going to say dot move to point x y times the usual um, point 16 here um, and then we can put that here And with a bit of luck, yay, we have a background. Right, not the most elegant solution. I think the other way, so the, so the other way to do this, um, because you can see here that I've kind of um, cheated and just stuck in that number as a hard-coded value. Um, the other thing you can do is you can cache this stuff in the view model. Um, the view model is just another model essentially, but the general idea is that model is for your actual game. It's the stuff that you would put in a, in a save game file. Um, and the view model is really for any intermediary data that you need to convert the model into something that you want to render, right? Um, and I quite often use it for, for caching and stuff like that. Uh, but in this case, I'm just, I'm just going to hard code it for the sake of the tutorial. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions or need help, please feel free to ask in the comments, reach out to us on social media, you can uh, raise an issue on the Indigo repo, um, or you can hop onto our Discord server for a bit of a chat. We're usually hanging around in there. Otherwise, uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and that you decide to give it a go.